Thank you all very, very much for joining me this morning. I greatly appreciate it. This is a course today on combustion analysis and troubleshooting. Before we get into it, a little bit on your bold friend up here. My name is Tyler Nelson. I am the instrumentation and industrial sales manager for Sourman. I'm a former contractor, proudly hold my master HVACR. Cell phone contact is there. I'm from New Jersey, so please don't hold that against me. Um, I know how to bury bodies, so you've seen the Sopranos, so there is that. Um, but anyway, email contact is there. That's my cell phone contact. I'm happy to be with you. It is an honor and a pleasure, and um, let's get rolling. So before we do, just a little bit on us as a company, and I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to go through this rather briskly, but at a proper pace. You'll see me skip through some things. If you want to see those things when we're done completely, I can always go back to them. You could take snapshots of them, whatever you'd like to do. But Sourman has a company, over 45 years of experience in the design and manufacturing of instrumentation. So I work in oil fields and on ships. I work on separators, um, combustors, things of that nature. Also work in regular HVAC environments, which was my contracting background. The one thing I want you to key off on, though, in this here is the design by Tex Vortex. Um, we're not going to really talk about product until the tail end. But stuff like this has your DNA all over it. And I know nobody ever wants to hear that. Um, but we designed these with a technician in mind because we elicited feedback from the industry. And uh, hopefully you'll see that when I go through these at the very, very end, time permitting. We have a whole lot of things we're going to go over. Uh, we're going to go over, this gonna, for some of you, it's going to be like drinking through a fire hose if you've never been exposed to combustion. And again, I can always slow it down after the fact or we can schedule a separate meeting if you'd like to do so. But Everything from mastering the obvious, the cross-contamination verification, why combustion is going to be more important now than ever before. I know as we're going green, you don't think that, but it is the opposite of what you think. The need to test why we should be testing, where we should be testing, carbon monoxide safety, the importance of gas pressure, and basically every other thing under the sun, and we're going to roll right into it. But before we do, in the words of the great Chuck Norris, keep your side of the street clean. You cannot control what happened before you got there. You cannot control what happens after you leave there. But you sure as heck can control your actions while you're there. That means doing your combustion analysis. A combustion analysis is a snapshot in time. It cannot be disputed. It's like your blood work. The doctor, when he does your blood work, he or she, that shows them the state of your health that day that you were there. What you do after that, if you decided to go on a bender, eat pizza, drink beer, whatever you're going to do, that's on you, but the state of your health was confirmed when you were there, for better or for worse. It's the same thing with combustion, because if you leave a job site, things are going to change. Other contractors are going to come in behind you and decide to, for example, cut off your flue piping that is vented through the roof, because when the roofer comes, the roofer goes, I don't think I like the way that looks. Let me cut that off. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to vent it into the attic, because that makes perfect sense. Right. Don't even get me going. Anyway, things are going to change. So if you do what you're supposed to do when you're there, I'm going to mention liability throughout this presentation. By the time I'm done, that should come in here and go right out here. It should be white noise to you because you already know what you're doing out there. And there is no combustion ferry or combustion troll. Use a manifold gauge set. We use gauges on air conditioning to properly diagnose a system. Weigh in a charge, check pressures. We use thermistors. We use thermocouples, right, to diagnose and properly ascertain the state of health of an air conditioning system, but yet, but yet, we light a fire in somebody's structure. Don't you think it would behoove us to actually monitor what we're lighting on fire and what it is producing? Because that's a considerably more dangerous proposition. But yet a very small percentage are actually using combustion analyzers. And, and, you think that what you're installing, that the manufacturer loves you so much, gives you a nice warm hug, that everything you're putting in is plug and play. No. They're made and manufactured in lab environments, in lab conditions. Are you installing in lab conditions? No. And I shouldn't shake my head like that because I'll probably break my neck. But no, you're not. You're installing in anything but. So 85% of systems you install need to have a little bit of a, a massage, a little bit of love shown to them. Okay, And I'm going to go over some of that a little bit later on. So not only does an analyzer do temperatures and pressures, keeps you safe because it acts as a per personal seal monitor. It does gas pressure for you. It has a whole host of other attributes, and it gives you efficiency. Now, it's combustion efficiency, which I'll cover a little bit, la little bit later, but it does give you efficiency. So you actually know not only the state of health of your patient, but how efficient your patient is running. 
Okay? Become a master of the obvious. I need you to take off these. I need you to see in the periphery. You're going to see money-making opportunities for yourself. And everything we're doing here and everything I'm going to show you is all hands above the table. There is no deceit. There is no snake oil here. It's all hands above the table. But if you look beyond what you're sent there to work on, you might notice some other opportunities for yourself that you didn't notice before. And we see things like this out there. Now, that's the extreme, right? That's the extreme. But we see things like this. Look at that. Can you see what that is? Those are flu properties piped into a supply trunk because that makes perfect sense, right? And now please don't leave here and make a run on Home Depot to go pick up some gutter leader for yourself to vent your flu piping because I'd be very, very sad if you did that and left me right now because I'm not done yet. Um, but we're seeing things like that. So you're working on this, wondering you know, how much ecstasy this person did when they installed this. Went over here, this is taking place, right? You gotta look. So this is really weird. I gotta look over here and check that as well. We all seen this before, right? Homeowner decides to put that in because he didn't want his kids to be cold in the winter. He's going to put the kids in the eternal sleeper hold. They're never going to wake up when they go down for a nap. Now, I don't like my children at times, but I wouldn't do that. If I'm going to take them out, I'm going to devise my own way to do it. And things like this. So you're looking at this over here, but over on the other side of the basement, there's this going on. So you're going to find things that are going to keep you out of liability, but are also going to keep the customer safe, and they're going to be revenue uh, um, sources for you. So your solutions providers for these challenges, consumer safety issues, high CO, heat exchanger problems, venting challenges, furnace boiler, water heater replacement opportunities, issues with the CAS, which is the combustion air zone, and you're there to increase callback. So by doing the complete job the right way, you're going to decrease all those potential issues and add to your profitability. Why are we here? And now I know your parents have always told you why you're here, and I, I love you like they do, even though I don't really know you. Um, but anyway, we're here because in our industry, there's a lot of change taking place. And in our country here in the United States, equipment that we return to a manufacturer that we think is defective is returned at the rate of 20 to 30 percent. Outside of our country and in Europe, that rate is about 3 percent. Now, it's not because the Europeans are heightier or mightier and better than we are. It's not that at all. But what they do is they practice combustion over there as mandatory fare which means it has to be done as a mandatory practice at least once per year in some places around the world twice per year. Okay? And the reason that those countries do that is because they get their fuel from Russia. It's very, very expensive. If they did not perform combustion analysis on a continuous basis and, and control all their um, combustion processes, their economies of scale would crumble. So they have to do it. So here's what's happening. Equipment's being obviously maintained correctly, but it's being commissioned correctly and it's being diagnosed correctly. Those three touches, or critical touches, during a piece of equipment's life cycle have dramatically driven down warranty claims. So it's changed the face of everything. And then you couple that with the fact that now we have certain municipalities making combustion analysis mandatory when you're installing or replacing a fuel-fired appliance. Outside of Colorado Springs, we're doing that. There was a family of four where the husband or the father of the family is permanently neurologically impaired. Technicians came in, replaced the furnace, installed a high-efficiency furnace, barely even connected the PVC connections. His office was adjacent to what was going on. For three months, he was breathing in carbon monoxide. Oh, and guess what? The carbon monoxide detectors they had in the house never went off, and I'm going to cover that later. So if you're reliant on those people to keep you safe, we're going to cover that. But they never went off, and his wife started to notice some decline in his mental performance. So he went to the doctor, got diagnosed, permanently neurologically impaired. They sued the contractor, the two installers, the township, and all the inspectors. Okay? Now that township outside of Colorado Springs makes this mandatory. Okay? So other pockets of the country are starting to do it. I know they're investigating doing it in my state of New Jersey as well. So, and then you add this add to the fact that now, because of everything going green, guess what I think they're going to have us do? Now, this is not confirmed yet, but this is my thought, and I've been asked this on podcasts, and I've said the same thing. I think they're going to start making us account for efficiency. So in order for you to keep your fuel-fired appliance in place, you're going to have to prove efficiency of it. And the only way that you can do that is with an analyzer because it gives you the combustion efficiency. Now, combustion efficiency on an analyzer is going to run between 1% and 5% of what the AFUE is, but it's going to be very, very close. Okay? So that's something that's changing. So we have a revolution in our industry. 
And with the manufacturers, with equipment being returned for warranty, they realize that, listen, we can't make it mandatory in the States for them to do combustion, but we can start to put it in our manuals. Cleaver Brooks, Triangle Tube, Navion starting to do it, putting in their manuals where you have to submit the combustion analysis for your customer to qualify for warranty. Starting to see that taking place now. So a revolution on the side of the manufacturers and on the side of municipalities has, has necessitated an evolution in the way that we practice. This is no longer business as usual. Targets here, CO2 and O2. They're putting in the manuals because they want you to test. You know, they want you to test. It's critical now. And then venting. By the way, are we aware that, hello, exactly. Um, PVC is going away as a means of exhaust venting in our industry. State of Massachusetts effective August 31st, 2021. No PVC used for exhaust venting purposes. If you encounter it, it's a red tag. If you go to install it that way, you're beat. It's happening, it's in the fibros in New York, it's been that way for years, parts of California, California, parts of Utah. Outside of our country, PVC is never used for exhaust venting, okay? We have been using it for purposes it was never intended to be used for. It's only designed to be used to transport condensate. We used to think it was the temperatures passing through the PVC that was causing the issue. That's only 20% of it. The other 80% of it is the NOx and all the acidic properties in the combustion byproducts passing through the PVC that it's causing it to degrade. If you couldn't the PVC three, four, five years into its life cycle when it's been installed in, a, in an exhaust application, it's gonna splinter and it's going to crack. It's because the chloride and that polyvinyl chloride inside is drying out. So it is absorbing the sample, drying out and starting to, starting to decay. And that is an issue. It's being replaced with polypropylene piping. Polypropylene, oh, by the way, what do we have here? Our fittings, right? Okay, show of hands, mine's not gonna go up. Read the back of your PVC glue. Tells you 12 to 18 hours to cure, right? Anybody in here giving something 12 to 18 hours to cure on a job site? No, we're not. So what happens is when that doesn't have a chance to cure, it's like you step on a piece of gum on a hot day and you pick your foot up and you get the strands of the gum stuck to your foot. That's what that's like, okay? So we're not giving it a chance to cure, what, let alone even sealing it properly to begin with. So polypropylene piping is replacing it. Companies like Centrotherm and Duravent are two of the leading manufacturers, and they also make gasketed fittings, so there's no longer a need for your PVC glue. So the industry is changing. So I'm letting you know this. What you do with this information is up to you, but I've made you aware, and hopefully going forward you will actually heed the call. And then we have issues like this. You ever see this before? You know what? I want to run a fresh air intake. It's the basement. It's fine. It's fine. Well, guess what? Say they decide to take up a hobby after you leave, and they start to do painting classes in their basement. And they're doing painting, and they have all the solvents and all the lacquers. And then, and then they do a lot of laundry, and then the bleach gets emitted into the atmosphere in the basement. That gets sucked down into here. Two most common people who kill heat exchangers, service technicians and homeowners, believe it or not. And I'll get to that a little bit later. But this is here would be both parties, because they didn't vent it, and yet, we have all these properties making their way down here into this system, okay? I can control, or I can control, we know it's a controlled experiment. If we vented this outside or pull fresh air from outside, that we're pulling 20.9% oxygen in because that's how the system is designed to run. But if we're not doing that, we're pulling properties from inside the house, that's an issue. We don't want to do that. And by the way, if you're looking to go to jail for manslaughter, I'm happy to help you. I'm a big fan of thinning the herd. I know there's people that aggravate us from time to time. However, this is not how we do things. This is not a concentric package, folks. <laughs> exactly. So we, we don't want to do such naughty things like that because that's how we get jammed up. So don't do that. It's a public service message. So what is combustion? Well, combustion is like football. We're on the heels of the Super Bowl here. That it's like a collision sport. We're going to collide three things together. We're going to collide a fuel source such as natural gas or number two oil. We're going to collide oxygen, and we're going to collide a heat source or a spark. When we collide those three things together, it produces rapid oxidation. The goal of rapid oxidation is for us to derive as much energy from the burning of the fuels as we absolutely can. But if we're not measuring, we have no idea what we're burning, what concentrations, and what the actual profile is. Okay, So we are producing things such as CO, NOx, and the like. You know, when, we, when I mentioned the example about the blood work, doing a combustion analysis is like getting your blood work done. You know, for example, we have high CO in the system right here. 
akin to high cholesterol in a body. Okay, there's correlations or parallels in those two universes that kind of meet each other. You know, in the tagline here, the best test while the rest guess, that's very appropriate for our conversation today because your best technicians are going to test. And if you haven't been testing, I'm going to cover these three phases a little bit later, but if you haven't been testing for commissioning and for diagnostics and at maintenance, you're, you're missing the boat. Okay, this is not just for O2 and CO anymore. It's just far more evolved than that. It's, sim it's simple, but it's far more evolved than that in the way that we should be looking at this as a practice. So we have three types of combustion, okay? Somebody pronounce this word for me. There you go. You all get a free analyzer. I lied, you don't. Um, but it's perfect combustion. Perfect combustion like my hairline does not exist. Okay, it does not exist for two reasons. One is the primary reason. It assumes that we have 100% air in the, 100 oxygen in the air that we breathe and we do not. As I mentioned it before, we have 20.9. By the way, the other 78% of that is nitrogen. The other 1% of that is typically argon gas or otherwise known as others. But in our country, it is argon gas, typically speaking. The secondary reason we cannot have perfect combustion is because we have thermal loss or heat loss with any combustion process that we employ. So we cannot have perfect combustion. So what are we left with? Two other types, incomplete and complete. Incomplete combustion is where we hover when we're not testing. This is for those that are not actually monitoring a system like they're supposed to be. And they don't know that they're producing issues with air supply, soot, CO issues, dirty, dirty and unsafe conditions, okay? Those are the ones that are not testing. The goal and what the manufacturers want us to do is migrate away from this and get to this, complete or good combustion. That is the best fuel to air ratio that ensures that all the hydrogen and carbon compounds are used up, nothing is left unburned. And we have three things that we're looking to ensure maximum efficiency, safety, and longevity of that piece of equipment. That's what we're striving for here, and that's what we're trying to get ourselves over to. Also, let's talk about excess air for a second. Um, we have fluctuations in the mixing of air and fuel in a system. Not only that, we have fluctuations in the amount of fuel being delivered, for, especially for gas systems, on a daily basis. Show of hands in here, if you're a service technician, and matter of fact, if everybody, if I'm, if I'm telling you to raise your hand, I want you all to raise your hand. Does everybody in here use a manometer? I know you do. Or, and they, sometimes they call it a manometer. It's not a manometer, it's a manometer, just so you know. But for those of you that use a manometer, and, we'll, and you should start, start testing this around your, you know, your areas around the country, you'll find out that gas pressure can change on a daily basis. You know, Rachel went over this yesterday where they can actually change the content of the fuel that is being delivered to you as well, okay? So, Things can change. You need to make sure you're checking gas pressure when you're dealing with a system because gas pressure is a heartbeat of a system. Before you're gonna do the bloods on it, so to speak, the blood work, combustion analysis, you wanna make sure it's got a heartbeat first. So we wanna strike that balance between not, between not too much and not too little. So it's a delicate balance so that we have proper efficiency with our system. And I'm not gonna belabor this. Rachel, um, I hate to keep mentioning Rachel, but Rachel did a very effective, Rachel Kaiser, Rachel, Rachel raise your hand please. Rachel did an excellent job yesterday going through the, the more the chemistry side of this, um, and she did a, a deep dive, but it was a deep dive that didn't lose anybody. So for those of you that attended yesterday, I'm not going to go on the heels of that successful presentation, so I'm just gonna touch upon this. So what I have here is for incomplete combustion, again, the scenario where we're not measuring, we have a lot of naughty things happening over here. We have high CO, we have hot fuel going up a hot stack and the, and the methane. We have, or natural gas with the methane. We have high temperatures and we have smoke. So by not measuring and not monitoring, we have no control over what's going on. We don't have control of the patient. We're not controlling the variables. So we wanna oscillate away from that and get ourselves and flip our pendulum and start testing. So we have horrible byproducts here, but when we start testing, look what happens here. The chemical, the makeup changes. We're producing carbon dioxide in the percentages that we want, but look at our right side of the ledger. We are producing CO2, water, heat, and oxygen. That are, that's what's going up the stack. Those are all byproducts of combustion that we want. Because when we have complete combustion, what we're doing is we're stepping over carbon monoxide to produce carbon dioxide. Because why? Because we have now testing, we're now bringing in, in enough excess air into a system, balancing that delicate equation, and again, ensuring the efficiency, safety, and longevity. So seven functions of highly effective analyzers. They're pretty cool devices. As you can probably tell, I don't exactly hate my job. Um, you know, this is not only a job for me, this is a hobby for me. I should probably get out more, but 
you'll find that by the time I'm done, that this tool has significant, significantly more important in your tool arsenal than maybe you thought it was before you walked in here. And maybe you have a, a better appreciation for it. But at the minimum, does combustion analysis? Yes. Ambient temperature, ambient CO, draft, gas pressure, because there's a pressure manometer built in each one of these. Could verify a cracked heat exchanger test on a forced air system. And by the way, I'm going to cover AHRI guideline X, which came out in 2023 for verifying a cracked heat exchanger. And the only way to do that is with this. And also can verify cross-contamination on a condensing system. So if you've never done that practice before, you're going to want to start doing that going forward. And I'm going to cover that a little bit later. So testing. Those of you that have never used an analyzer, this is just a brief synopsis of what we have. So I'm just going to cover this in no particular order. But the one thing I do want to focus on right here, believe it or not, as simple as that is, that's positioning cone. That actually keeps your probe in the stack nice and straight. Because if you don't have that, the probe's going to hang out, and it's going to fall, and you're going to go to grab it, and you're going to burn your hand, and you're going to hate me because you went to my class, and I didn't teach you this. So I just taught you that, so don't do that. So the positioning cone goes in, probe goes in, it gets locked down. All right? So you're going to turn your analyzer on outside in fresh air with no probes or hoses attached. Why do we do that? Because when you turn it on outside in fresh air, it is zeroing itself out for you, calibrating itself to fresh air. So you're going to see 20.9% oxygen, zero CO, and anywhere from zero CO2 to 0 0.06 CO2, depending on the analyzer, how many decibel, decibel points it goes over, or how accurate it is. We do 0 0.06 because we go an extra decimal point. So with the, but the reason you're doing that, though, is to make sure this starter protocol is correct. If you didn't listen to me and you started up inside of here, and we had 100 ppm of CO in here, you wouldn't know it because you, you didn't start this up correctly and it's going to show you zero. And then we go to this room over here and we have 200 ppm of CO over there. It's only going to show you 100 because you've negated the first 100. So you're not going to see that, okay? That is an issue. And the reason why I don't want any probes or hoses attached to the bottom is I don't want you to uh, run the risk of pulling the remnants of a previous combustion test, whether it was yesterday, whether it was last week, or whether it was two hours ago, run the risk of you pulling that into here and also doing the same thing. So I don't want that to take place. All right, start it up outside in fresh air. You're going to go inside. You're going to perform an ambient CO test. Show of hands in here. Anybody wear a personal CO monitor when they work? Very good. For those of you that don't, I like all of you. I care about all of you. This acts as a personal CO monitor. And I'm going to cover that a little bit later with CO. But you're going to monitor the ambient environment for carbon monoxide with this, and I'll cover that in a second. After you've done that, you're going to verify gas pressure. Obviously, start the appliance up. Also, select the appropriate fuel. Fuel selection is very important. Here's why. Every fuel has a coefficient assigned to it. It is an identifier. So for example, and I'm just throwing a number out, so don't quote me on the number. Say natural gas is 0 0.076845 called Jenny. I don't know, something like that. So say it's like that. That number is multiplied by the percentage of oxygen that the analyzer is reading. That resulting multiplication answer is what gives you your CO2, because CO2 is a calculated value. Okay? So it's very important that you select the appropriate fuel, because if you don't, your CO2 is going to be off and your efficiency is going to be off. So something to note. Locate the proper testing point anywhere from 6 to 10 inches above the breach here, depending on where you're going on, this, on the system that you're working on. And the probe goes in midway. We never bottom out. Because you bottom out, you restrict the amount of sample and the sample time because you're kissing the back wall of the actual flue pipe. So we do not bottom out. And then you're going to evaluate combustion during those different stages, uh, obviously light off, steady state, and also shut down. And also going to verify draft, OK? And I'm going to cover draft here in a little while. General combustion testing advice. High efficiency systems, 90% or greater. Test no less than one foot above the inducer outlet, but no greater than two. Efficiency relates to combustion efficiency, which is fuel utilization, not the appliance's overall efficiency. So AFUE does a couple of things. First of all, it typically rates on a 50-degree load. We don't live in 50-degree loads outside. Second of all, it assigns a multiplier or a factor to high-efficiency systems that boosts it up. So your analyzer, when it gives you your efficiency, is going to be anywhere from 1% to 5% lower than the, efficiency of the, the stated efficiency of the appliance. All right? But it's going to be very, very close. So you can still sell on that, and I'll go over that in a minute. So that is fuel utilization. Then you're going to evaluate oxygen during the entire combustion cycle. You're going to check for stabilization, escalation, and decline. You're going to monitor what your CO is doing. And I'm going to give you general guidelines, and I'm going to touch upon this a few more times during the presentation. So your general guidelines are this, and these are under steady state conditions. 
general industry guideline. 100 ppm or less in the stack is acceptable. 200 ppm or greater in the stack is a potential red tag situation. 400 ppm or greater in the stack and red tags under, under steady state running conditions is a, advised to lock out, which means I'm shutting you off. I don't care that your brother's an attorney and, and your mom's a judge. I'm shutting you off anyway, okay? Just to keep everybody safe. Then we look at it, when we look at carbon monoxide, does it spike up at startup? Does it come down to level within specification? And does it spike at the end of a cycle? And then CO air free is like a bourbon neat and CO is like a bourbon on the rocks. So when we're looking at monitoring the ambient environment for carbon monoxide, which I'm gonna cover, you wanna use regular CO on your analyzer. However, when you're looking at the byproducts of combustion, and you're actually doing combustion analysis, I want you to use CO air free. CO air free is your combustion number with the oxygen taken out of it. So it is pure, unadulterated carbon monoxide. Why do I and the other experts want you to do it? Here is why. CO air free is your hell number. If your hell number looks like heaven, within the specifications, you're in very good shape. So two rules of thumb. One, regular CO for CO monitoring. Number two, CO air free when you're actually doing combustion analysis, at least in my opinion, and I share that opinion with others that are out there, all right? Now, up to this point, if you just use regular CO on your analyzer because you didn't know any different, you've done nothing wrong. I'm just letting you know, if you want to be a dork like me, that's what you should do. This little sheet here, this just shows some different percentages or different readings for the different systems you're going to work on. Uh, Jim Bergman and the folks at MeasureQuick have produced this excellent combustion guide that we can get to the folks here. We can email it to, to whomever, for, for Kalos or Brian or his staff and they can get it to you if you want it, but it's also available online. But Jim put it together, it's about nine pages. Uh, by the way, we're on MeasureQuick as, a com as the analyzer of choice, or the analyzer on MeasureQuick now, which I'll go over at the end. But that combustion guide is much better than what you see here. It gives you excess air, it gives you everything. So just just a little sample of what you're gonna see on his diagram, and it's much better than this. So what the bleep do these readings mean? I covered excess air, I covered CO air free. I wanna talk about efficiency total as I mentioned here. So 82.8, okay? So again, it's combustion efficiency, which is the fuel utilization, but this is how this works. So you go to your customer if you're a contractor and say, listen, when you bought this from us 26 years ago, it was an 80% efficient, it's the best you could afford, it's the best we had at the time. However, now, as you can see by our maintenance visit, we're at 60%. We've had a series of repairs over the last 78 years. You know, it, it, it doesn't owe you anything. It's getting old, it is tired. So what we can do for you is this, because right now, when you bought it from us, 20 cents of every dollar was going up the stack, but now the dynamics have changed, where 40 cents or almost half of every dollar is going up the stack. We can install a high efficiency system for you that'll be rated, say, 96%, which is where our customers seem to gravitate to. We'll give you a good, better, best, you pick what you want, but we think you're gonna pick the 96 percenter. And on the day that we commission it, because we want you to keep this maintenance report, because we want you to compare and contrast it to your commissioning report we're gonna give you because we're gonna start your, your system up with an analyzer as well. We're gonna show you the efficiency and you're gonna see on the day that we install it, depending on the weather, it'll be between 91 and 95% probably. So you're gonna see that not only are we telling you what you're getting and you're just believing us like you believe, believe this in the past, we're actually gonna give you concrete data where we're gonna show you. Because everyone in this room should know this. If you don't know this, I'm gonna tell you this now. Whatever you're telling your customer, when you walk out the door, they're Googling it or they're calling their brother who's an engineer because he knows better than you, right? That's what they're doing, right? We've all been there before. Or you go to leave for a repair that you just priced up for somebody and you go to leave and it's always somebody that has to put their glasses on the bridge of the nose. They're like, Ty, Ty, don't leave yet. This is, whoa, I'm very uncomfortable. Hmm. Weird. You quoted me 470 but I can get the part on Amazon for 11 bucks, what gives? You've all been there, right? This will prevent that from happening because you're gonna be able to prove to everybody what you're doing with data from the reporting that you can actually get off a combustion analyzer and we'll cover that when I talk about this at the tail end. So you can sell off of this sticker. So if you ha didn't think you could in the past, trust me, I've helped many contractors make thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars just with that strategy alone. And then one that's very, very simple here that we seem to forget, T-Flu. If you lower the stack temperature by making certain adjustments, gas pressure, um, blower speed, whatever, you make certain adjustments, if that temp stack temperature goes down, the efficiency goes up. Why? The BTUs aren't going up the stack, they're going in the space to heat it, okay? They're going in the space to heat it. So very, 
very important. And by the way, I, don't, I think I might have something on the agenda. If not, I'm going to tell you. You hear a lot. Or you can adjust his gas pressure. What's the big deal? Very simple comment to you. The simplest of adjustments can have the greatest downstream effect. So you adjust gas pressure. Guess what that affects? Oxygen safety. Carbon monoxide, the safety. The amount of NOx is being produced, safety. The efficiency of the equipment, the longevity of the equipment, all those things, and that's just off the top of my head. There are many things that are affected and impacted by the simplest of adjustments. Also, what you're affecting is the interplay of how different components play nicely or not nicely in the sandbox with other components when you make those adjustments. So you're taking the, the burden off of things misbehaving and you're eliminating it by having things run efficiently and, effect efficiently and effectively from the jump. So carbon monoxide safety, let's go back to this now. Victim identified after timber top apartment units evacuated for carbon monoxide. This was a little over a year ago, okay, 2022. Again, I asked you how many people are using or wearing a personal monitor. Just so you're aware, we have the highest rates of dementia and Alzheimer's that exist of all the service industries. It used to be oil and gas. Oil and gas is open air, right? They're, they work in very well ventilated areas. The average retirement age of a technician in our field, 56 years of age, 56. They don't know if it's body strain, but they're also no, noticing now neurological challenges, okay? I'm part of the, 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 the National Coalition for Carbon Monoxide now. And I mentioned them when I joined, I said, you know what's weird? So my stepfather worked in um, boiler rooms his entire life when he was in the Navy, and when he got out of the Navy when he was a professional. He worked in boiler rooms his whole life. He died of glioblastoma at the age of 58, brain cancer, right? And I said, it's gonna sound weird, but when he died in 2003, they said to my mom, and said, listen, we don't know if it maybe the environments he worked in had an impact because we're starting to see a little bit of something here. It's kind of weird. So I asked the, the, the coalition and their jaws dropped and they said, we just had a meeting about this. The most, the most common people who die from glioblastoma, one of the most common statistics are people that work in, with furnaces and boilers and were not protected for carbon monoxide, just so you know that. So it is a rampant thing. I like all of you. I want you to keep you, keep you safe. So if you're relying on your customers to keep you safe with the carbon monoxide detectors that they have, you're going after the wrong brass ring. People are going to choose the cheapest thing possible for carbon monoxide detection. You know why? Because they don't get any social mileage out of it. It's not a nice car. It's not a well-manicured lawn. It's not a pristine pool. It's not a 4K display on the wall. They're going to spend the cheapest thing just because they have to. Okay? So if you're reliant on that to keep you safe and you go into a job site, you're wrong. You're wrong. Here's what you get. 9 ppm over 25, or over, excuse me, over 24, 35 ppm over eight hours at an office environment. You know when those detectors that you see on the wall, they go off after 70 to 300 ppm after one to three hours of exposure. That's an issue. So by that time, it already has its hooks into you. And it can come from many sources. The most common sources, by the way, ovens, stoves, water heaters, then furnaces and boilers and the like. So you don't think you need one in the summer, right? You're wrong. You ever go into a house for an air conditioning call, you walk inside, you go, you're making cookies? It smells really good. Yeah, you want some on the way out? Sure. Guess what they're using to make the cookies? A fuel-fired appliance. But you didn't think that. So if you don't have a personal monitor, you want to have an analyzer because it's going to keep you safe, okay? So many sources. I didn't mean to have that be so loud. That was weird. So we have, for example, generator outside, gas grill, car in a garage, oven or stove, fireplace, water heater, excuse me, uh, clothes dryer, water heater, furnace or boiler, and then we have blockage in the chimney. You also could have issues with a neighbor's appliance that is vented out because people do work without permits that your fresh air intake, if you have a condensing system, is pulling in or high efficiency system is pulling in. So we have that challenge. So we have a multitude of sources, so you could be noticing an issue that you weren't sent there to work on, but you could be saving a life by monitoring the environment because you can't rely on what these people have there to monitor it for you, okay? Very, very important. Again, it's odorless, colorless, tasteless, and don't think, if your customer says to you, you know what, I need somebody to come out, I smell carbon monoxide, and you look at yourself in your office and you're like, this person needs to go into the nut hut because they can't smell, taste, or see it, we know that, right? Not so fast. They could be crazy, and they could need to go into the nut hut, but 
interlaced in what they're smelling could be something that you can't smell, taste, or see, which could be carbon monoxide. So what's happening is you have another combustion process taking place that they're smelling the off-gassing from, chances are. Interlaced in that could be the actual carbon monoxide. You don't know. So you can't, you got to take all of those concerns or complaints seriously, diagnose them, and move on to the next thing. Your furnace is more than a furnace. It is a complete system, okay? It's in an ecosystem. It's in a living and breathing environment that changes continuously through different pressures, opening, closing doors, renovations, and the like. So poor combustion is typically a byproduct of poor insulation. Good visual inspection will notice a lot of things. You know, issues with the filtration system. We have a filter track that's open. Um, control system, makeup air. Do we have issues in the cast? Do we have issues with with paint solvents sitting in front of an atmospheric system being pulled in. Do we have those challenges? Um, things that are gonna relate to combustion safety. You know, is the system firing correctly? You know, using an analyzer. But again, a good visual inspection is gonna denote some of the things that you see here. So commissioning. If it's new, why do we have to test? Well, again, you assume it's set up correctly. The factory doesn't like you that much. I do, but they don't, okay? They don't like you that much. Again, they're, they're created in lab environments. You have to make sure that you're setting them up for success and looking at what the manual says. And if the manual doesn't have it, the combustion guy that Jim put together does. Setup can change in transit. You ever take, looks, the box looks, box looks great that it came in, but it's dented. Or, worse than that, it's not dented, but you don't know if it was shaken or jostled. You don't know if the burners got misaligned. You don't know if gasketing fell off. You don't know if something got unseated. We don't know. Okay, we have, to, we have to set the system up correctly. The only way to do that is with an analyzer. If you live in different, ele in higher elevations, you know, these, these, these systems are set up at sea level. What are the conditions where you're at? You know, we're all here from different parts of the country. What is the gas pressure where you're installing? As I mentioned, test this on a daily basis. You're going to see that it's going to be different. It's going to fluctuate for you. And then commissioning instructions are typically in the install manual with giving you the parameters for O2, CO, and CO2, God willing. And if they're not, you can get it online or you can get it from gyms. That'll give you the general consensus for that type of piece of equipment. And then venting. You want to check the install manual, check the quality of the intake air for condensing systems, which I'm going to cover, and also check your draft, which I'm going to cover. So very important for commissioning. And then seasonal maintenance. Why should we combustion test every time you engage a fuel-fired appliance? Well, you touch it, you're liable for it. These people can sue you. They can sue your families. They can sue your company. And you, don't, you don't think that's the case. I'm going to show you here in a few minutes where that is the case. You cancel how it's running just by looking at it, right? We've all dated those wonderful, beautiful people that we thought were so great on the exterior, and then like about a weekend, we realize that we're, that we're dating Satan, right? We've all been there, right? You know what that's like? Same kind of thing. Don't judge a book by its cover, the old adage, right? Did the last technician leave it running correctly? You could have the best technician have the best day, and the worst technician have the best day. doesn't matter. They both had a good day, but you still don't know because from visit to visit, things change. People make renovations. People change the envelope of the house. They install different things. Other contractors come in, do work behind you. Electricians cut things. Roofers, as I mentioned before, cut things. Things change. You need to treat each visit as a new mutually exclusive event unto itself. And then is the draft correct? Do we look at the draft? Do we look at the pressure, the gas pressure? Did we do the blood work on that system? Okay, did we do the analysis on that system to know that from visit to visit it is running efficiently and effectively? So checklist, we want to check draft, gas pressure, smoke test, we're working on an oil system, please. Combustion analysis, obviously. Correct heat exchanger verification, check for cross-contamination, and also AME and CO monitoring. Diagnostic, a little bit here. You're using your analyzer as a diagnostic tool. How can we find, solve, and prevent issues with an analyzer? Pillar number one, diagnose. What direction is the analysis pointing you in? Okay, do we have a cracked heat exchanger? Do we have a draft issue? Do we have a, a gas valve issue? Second pillar, solve. You're going to solve whatever that repair is. Because when it comes to diagnostics, an analyzer is going to do one of two things. It's either going to give you a basically a neon sign that says you must repair or replace this because the readings make it so evident, or it is going to lay down in front of you a series of breadcrumbs that you are to pick up, analyze, and either go with that repair, because you know what the issue is, or go to the next clue with the readings. So it's going to do one of two things. But without an analyzer, 
going to be very, very difficult for you to ascertain. So if you've not been using one to this point, this is going to really shorten your diagnostic life and make you a much more effective uh, diagnostic technician. So, but after you do that, you're going to test again. Because if you replace the part, you want to make sure that the part that you replaced was the right part, and that's going to be verified by the reading, because now your reading is going to be within specification. And then you're going to prevent. You're going to test it every visit to prevent issues and costly repairs. You're going to be the pro in proactive. So three stages of combustion diagnostics. Light off. First 60 seconds. That's ignition. I know a lot of people don't want you to test it light off. I disagree. I want you to test it light off. You're going to see habitual things that are going to happen at light off that can manifest themselves into, into the general run, run cycle or steady state conditions. But you're also, if you've been doing this long enough or you get experience with this, you know at light off you're going to see certain erraticacies that you understand the tolerance for. But there's going to be when it really gets out of whack that you know something is off. Okay? And you can, and we can, there's other classes that I do where I actually go through and break down the diagnostics as what components are making this misbehave. We really don't have much time for that today. I got a few examples, but today is not the time for that one. And then run cycles. You're going to have, or, which, is, which is what I term as steady state, um, you know, for the, for the general consensus for everybody here. So three CO readings and oxygen readings. You want to do it within five minutes or longer. Um, the doctor's not just going to take one heartbeat on you. Is he or she? You want to have more than just a single reading. You want to have a series of readings. I want it running for a while. Okay, I want it running for a while, which is anywhere from five minutes. You can have it run longer than that. And then you're going to take your draft when you're at that last set of readings because that's your roughly your perfect steady state conditions, and that's when you want to capture your draft. Uh, and then shut down the last 60 seconds, and the system is going to be symptomatic of issues in those last 60 seconds when the burners cut, when the, when the flame cuts out, because you could have a leaky valve that is going to be evident by a high rise in CO or when the, when the system goes into shutdown period and you see a high oxygen, that could be an indication of a secondary heat exchanger not, not draining and filling with water. You know, remember, you can't use an analyzer for diagnostics, right? Come on. Yes, you can. So four diagnostics missed, testing under steady state. Uh, so for example, light off. Shows up as a rise in carbon monoxide and peaks and then falls. Venting issues. Shows up as a rise in carbon monoxide and falling oxygen with high draft. Combustion air, rising carbon monoxide, falling oxygen with no draft. And then bad gas valves when a system goes into shutdown. Again, if that oxygen goes up, you know. All the stuff you're learning here, specifically informa information that came off of this slide, is compliments of the folks at NCI, okay? What I'm giving you here is strictly an appetizer for your combustion information. That's all it is. That's all it is. This is the starting point. They're the ultimate professional point for this. Dominic, Rob, David, you know, they're the, the, the multi-day course that is going to take what I'm showing you here, expand upon all of it, and drill down on it. So again, I'm happy that you're here with me today. I, I couldn't be any happier. Um, however, if you really want to do this in the best way possible and be the best technician walking the planet, you go see these folks, you take a course by them, you expand your knowledge. Okay. My my thoughts, but it's the industry's consensus as well. So we also want to look at the, the condensate. We have issues with, you ever see this down here, right? All that? We don't want to see that. So we have, tra make sure your trap is prime, look for evidence of leaks, make sure we're draining correctly, make sure we have the proper slope. So it's not just combustion. There's other things that feed into other things that are symptomatic of, of challenges with the system. Because you're not just wearing a combustion hat all the time. You're wearing your technician hat all the time, your diagnostic hat all the time. So general diagnostic insights. For example, this is just a small sample of, of what the diagnostics are, and there's multiple, multiple slides that we can do on diagnostics. This is just a sample. So CO spike at 2,000 ppm or above at light off. Possible indicator of delayed ignition, igniter issue, thermocouple issue. O2 spike when the fan comes on. Gasket issue, crack in a, sec on a, excuse me, in a primary heat exchanger. And I'm going to go over cracked heat exchangers at the tail end. CO spike at shutdown. Again, as I mentioned earlier, possible indicator, indication of leak, leaky valve. High CO and high temperatures. Possible over fire condition. Again, think to yourself if you're an experienced tech. You're going to find this stuff without an analyzer? No, you're not. You want to think you can because you didn't use one at this point, and I'm sure you were very effective. But if you want to be more effective than anything you've ever done before, you're going to use an analyzer now. And then draft not within spec. 
Do we have a draft inducer issue? Do we have a blockage? Do we have a barometric damper issue? Do we have a compromised chimney? We don't know. We have to check and verify. And for those that are fans of the Little Rascals, that's for you. Remarkable. We're not going to cover oil. We're not going to do, we're going to bypass commercial. But there is one thing I do want to show you. Okay, it's this. You can extrapolate this or bring this, dial this back to a residential side of things. Okay. Take a look at this. I just want to focus on a few things. First off, when you're doing your readings, I want you to have a, a, an initial reading for yourself before you make any adjustments to a system. I want that because I want you to see and for you to show your customer the impact that you've just made. Because a lot of you are leaving potential relationship building and money on the table by not doing this first. So if you read right here, adjust the fuel, and this is for a commercial boiler, but Again, just let me finish and I'll tie everything in. Adjust the fuel to air ratios from the burner management system to prevent soot and CO issues, thus preventing dangerous conditions and inefficiencies. In the residential world, that's a fancy way of saying, I tinkered with gas, gas pressure and I, and I checked the blower speed. But the changes of that, remember the simplest of things have the greatest downstream effect, the changes of that are profound. Look what's happened. By doing that, you have increased the efficiency. It went from 81.3 to 84.1. Your losses went from 18.7 down to 15.9. Your excess air needed for combustion went from 78% down to 38. So you, you're using your fuel significantly more efficiently, hence the increase in efficiency. But look at your dew point, 120 to 127, okay? See your dew point here? That's that system thinking it wants to become a condensing system. It's not, but it thinks it wants to be because you've increased the efficiency of so much. The dr driving up that dew point just a little bit, it's not a condensed, it's not even close, but driving up that dew point has done that. But look at the savings. This was done, the cost of this was done over a year, over, oh, just about a year ago, a little over a year ago. So by this efficiency savings on this rooftop, if this was left unchecked for the rest of the year, would have saved these people $1,400 compared to what the previous reading was. So for those of you that make adjustments that don't think you're making an impact, you are wrong. You are making a huge impact every single day. So again, as I told you, the simplest of adjustments have the greatest downstream effect. Draft and spillage. Oh my God, I don't have a draft hood. Yes, you do. All right, what do we have right here? It's a compliment to the great Jim Bergman right there. That's why. You ever see this before? All right? Check sizing, pitch, look for proper support, proper termination. Uh, make sure you're free of corrosion. And look for those blockages. And the venting issues come into play. That's pitting right there. It's all the rusting that takes place. Here's what we got. That's why it's been bold. Many times the larger appliance will spill through the smaller appliance when blockage occurs. So we have issues that happen right in down in here when we're not drafting. We're not having enough pressure to get out. So the drafting issues right there. Right? But Want to set up worst case, worst case conditions. You want to emulate conditions that are going to take place when you're no longer there. So if you're installing a system, open and close doors. Turn it on and off interior fans. Change the static pressure or the pressure inside the structure to mimic things that are going to take place when you're not, not around. Okay? Not just the perfect conditions while you're there. Okay? You want to do all these things to mimic real life. So your checklist for the CAS. Worst case depressurization, look at spillage, check draft, undiluted CO test, and then do your ambient CO monitoring. So a few things here. So we have an atmospheric and we have a condensing system. We're going to talk about draft here. We're going to talk about cross-contamination. So an atmospheric system uses room air or makeup air for its combustion air. Okay? So if you, for example, have a customer that has one of these systems here and they decide to make their furnace or boiler room into their office and they say, you know what? I don't like that louver door because it looks stupid. I want a nice solid core door. I want to make my office into a bank vault. So they put the solid core door, and two days in, they can hear their spouse over on the other side of the basement working from home as well. They're like, that's driving me crazy. I don't want to keep these, seal these um, drop ceiling. I want to put sealed ceilings in, right? And then a couple days in, their system is short cycling. Why? It doesn't have enough air coming back to it. They've starved it for air. So what are you going to do? Put the louver door back on. Oh, I can't do that. No, 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 no. So what do you do? You cut two faux return grills right above or somewhere up in there, you bring air in because you don't have an option, right? But you have to bring in air. So when we talk about these kinds of systems, we can have competition for that makeup air. 
Uh, we can have an incorrect stack size, duct leakage, barometric damper issue, and again, changes that furnace or boiler room, right? In a condensing system over here, we have issues with induced draft motors, or we can have a blockage. It is getting very common now for people to have high efficiency air condensing systems. And typically, they're vented out the side. Well, guess what? Rodents can get in there. Children can do naughty things with that stuff. <laughs> right? So we've had. So back, there are some people in this room that do have salt in their beard. And, th and so they'll remember these things. Remember matchbox cars? Matchbox cars served two purposes when I was a kid. One, it gave you something to do. And number two, they came with an orange plastic track, which your parents would whack you with if you pissed them off. So this one young man, you know, and back when I was young, they weren't collectibles. Now I guess they are. So this one gentleman had about four grand worth that his son decided to take out of the cases and see how many he could fit down the exhaust pipe. Needless to say, I'm, I guess he wish he didn't create that child. Um, then I was at a job site with a technician, and they could not, he could not figure out why the system could not get started because he wanted to commission it with his analyzer. He goes, I can't get this thing running. They're outside. I'm looking at the flu, and I go, what's, what's in there? Is that a rodent? I'm, like, I'm not reaching my hand in there. I don't know what that is. Luckily, the homeowner was outside at the same time, proceeds to pull three bags of weed out of the exhaust. <laughs> so at that point, we learned a couple of things. One, one, we learned that his son had a fascination with the devil's cabbage. So big pot smoker, God bless him. It's legal in my state, whatever. Nothing I like outside doing yard work with my wife and going, I just got a contact high. Somebody just drove by and I smell, smell weed. Um, so that happened. So things will happen, though. R animals will make a nest, whatever the case may be. So when you're testing these things, we need to make sure we have proper drafts. So for an atmospheric system, it is minus 0.02 to minus 0.04 inches of water column. For a condensing system, it is positive 0.02 to positive 0.08 inches of water column. Either way, when you go for a service visit, you need to make sure that there is no issue with the venting. You need to make sure that, that, a, that a plant didn't grow up in there and, and, and cause a blockage. And remember this, you're all, because you're all elite, if you're contractors, you're all elite contractors now, you're taking on new customers every day. Guess what you're doing? You are inheriting that previous contractor's craftsmanship or craftspersonship for better or for worse. I would assume the worst. It's like when you buy a house and you move in a house that someone else has lived in, are you just going to move in there without cleaning it? No, no, no. You don't know if the dogs had pet dander. You don't know what odd habits the people had. Now, they could be, I don't even know what people do in their homes, but I'm sure it wasn't good. Um, I wouldn't want to shine a blue light, but anyway, I digress. But anyway, we want to verify those things. But something I want to show you here is this. This is important. Not that the rest of it wasn't. Anyway, OK. So your systems are designed to receive, take in, or ingest 20.9% oxygen. Anything less is going to create a problem. Anything less is going to be basically have NOx properties to it. Because anytime we drop under 20.9% oxygen, we have improprieties or impurities in, uh, in the air coming into a system, which typically carbonic acid, NOx, and those kinds of things. So NOx and those other byproducts are acidic gases. They eat what they touch. So this is how this is like, what this is like. So you take this bottle of water. And a lot of you don't know me, but some of you do. I travel a lot. I'm gone 10 months out of the year, and I'm married to a saint. And she hasn't killed me yet, but I'm sure she's trying. And um, so for example, I was home a couple right after I got home from AHR last week. And I'm home for a couple days. And I'm sure I drove her crazy. So say, for example, I go to leave on this business trip. And before I leave, she sees my water bottle. She puts a couple of drops of Drano in there and says, hey, Ty, have a good time in Orlando. You're going to have fun in sunny Florida. I'm stuck here in the toxic wasteland of New Jersey. Have fun. But she puts a couple of drops of Drano. She swivels her hips, and she walks away. Three days in, my throat's burning me. I start coughing up blood. Why? I have a foreign invader. What's happening is that my esophagus is wearing away, as well as my stomach lining. That is because of what I took into my system. That is what happens to a system when we have less than 20.9% oxygen. Remember I told you in the beginning that we are returning systems at the rate of 20 to 30%. You know why that is? 
is because they're wearing away. We are wearing away the mechanicals because the oxygen coming back to a system is not what it is supposed to be because we're installing things incorrectly and we're not verifying the quality of the intake air, okay? Quality of the intake air. I had five leading equipment manufacturers put me on a panel and asked me, because you know, they went to my presentation, they said, we understand there is an oxygen issue because we see it, because we're the ones that are processing all these returns. And they said, you're installing our equipment wrong. I said, really? They said, yes. I said, okay. I asked the one manufacturer, what's your most popular furnace? Says it. I said, okay. One guy had a tablet. I said, do me a favor. Look up that install manual for that furnace, please. Looks it up, hands it to me. And I look in front of, front of all five of them, start thumbing through, going through the manual. It's interesting. This is going to be weird. I see no parameters for combustion. I see nothing on oxygen, nothing on carbon monoxide, and nothing on CO2. But yet, you're complaining that there's an oxygen issue coming back to the system, but yet you're not giving the parameters of, what, of the way and, and how you want things tested. So I said, if you want us to do it, we'll do it, but you have to put the parameters in there. So I said, you might want to change your manuals. They're like, oh, we didn't realize. Yep, so now you know. So hopefully that will be a change we're going to see going forward they're going to, where they're going to have more information for us to set their systems up correctly. So what you're going to do is this, and this is done at install. So if you're installing a fresh new piece of equipment, you want to test this because you want to make sure that you either vented this correctly, but also when you're installing or taking on a new customer or doing this for the first time, turn on the other fuel fighter appliances in that structure. You want to make sure you have no migration from another fuel fire appliance with its byproducts of combustion making their way into this fresh air intake. Your probe is going to go into the fresh air intake, midway in, anywhere 6, 10 inches up here, but midway in. And you're going to look at your analyzer, and you're going to verify you have 20.9% oxygen. If you do not have 20.9% oxygen, you have cross-contamination. We've had customers that have didn't know this, that have bushes that have grown up, that have covered, created an air curtain. So when the exhaust blows out, it hits the boxwood hedge, and whatever doesn't pass through bounces off and gets pulled back into the fresh air intake. Drops it. I had an instructor in Ohio drop his system down at 16.8. He was wondering why the last four years it looked like it was aging before his eyes, and he never had the time to pay attention to it because the shoemaker's kids go without shoes. He never had the time. But when he took the class, took my class, he learned this. He went back home, did it immediately, and that's what he found. And then he had to rip the bushes out, which he was happy to do. But that's what it was. So we always want to make sure we're checking the quality of the intake air coming back to a system. Show of hands, anybody using a gas leak detector? Should be. Should be. It's going to keep you from getting jammed up. It's, going to, it's a silent killer with gas leaks, man. It's, it's, it's bad, bad stuff, you know. It is going to save you so many headaches. It's the best way to detect it. It's the fastest way to do it. If you don't have one, we have one. I'd like to be buying one. But whatever you pick is, is, your, is on you. I'm just happy that you have one. Do they have that at True Tech? They do. At True Tech, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And if they don't have it in stock, we can get it to them right away, but they should have it. So. Probably by the end of the week? Yes. Yep, for sure. Definitely by the end of the week. Never assume all is fine. Clock that meter. Change the orifice when necessary. So, adjust the fuel pressure to the manufacturer specifications. Typical nominal low fire is 1.7. High fire, 3.5. Typical range, 3.2 to 3.8. You want to be no less than positive or plus or minus 2% of what it says in the rating, uh, the input rating on the um, appliance's rating plate. Higher settings can create flame impingement, taxing of the system's capabilities, and high CO. But lower settings can create overheating in high CO due to incomplete combustion. How does that happen? Because if you have a lower setting, you don't have this nice pristine flame that you see, right, and, and, and represented in, in, in pictures and that kind of thing. What happens? with a lower setting is that the flame starts to elongate slowly. And as the flame elongates and it can't burn correctly, that's is creating the high amount of carbon monoxide. It's not the crisp burn, it is an elongated burn, which has the, creates, creates the increase in carbon monoxide for that scenario. So what does this look like? Before and an after. On the left is the before. So those of you who use an analyzer, Show of hands, how many here is ever, who in here has ever spiked or overranged a CO sensor? Yay. Just so you know, for those of you that saw people raise their hand and you didn't raise yours, that just meant that those people were doing their job. It's going to happen. You're just doing your job. That's all it is. Doing your job. Okay? So let's look at this. And you all know, by the way, those of you that have spiked it, know it's the fastest thing to react when you make adjustments to a system, too. So before scenario, we have 
35 ppm of carbon monoxide. We have like 9% oxygen and about stack temperature about 243. When we make an incorrect adjustment to gas pressure, look what happens. CO goes through the roof. It's the fastest thing in the rack. It's going to shoot up like a rocket ship. Oxygen starts to plummet, right? Stack temperature is on the rise. So if left unchecked or unadjusted again, you're going to have a shortening of service life. You're going to have a crushing of the efficiency. But most important, you're going to have a very, very dangerous condition that you're, that you're going to want to get taken care of and rectify very, very quickly. But if you don't think that this is important, I think you will now. September 14th, 2018, one dead, 12 hospitalized, 39 homes destroyed. I know a lot about this because a personal friend of mine was hired to be on, on the behalf of both the plaintiff and the defendant to do the forensics on this case. Very interesting scenario. Um, they were, when this happened, they were suing or looking to sue any technicians that have been to these properties during a 12 month period. And one of them in specific that was being sued um, was being sued at the time he was fired by his employer. He was being sued by all the, the township, all the surrounding towns, by all the families. And by the way, the 18-year-old, I mean, excuse me, the one person who died, 18-year-old young man, was, and he died in front of his parents. They saw him die. He was sitting in his brand new used car that his parents bought him, right? Sitting in his driveway, listening to his music because he just got his license at the age of 18. You know why he was sitting in that car? Because he could. Parents are watching TV, and the, the, when the explosions happened, or when, the, when this issue happened, the chimney came off the top and side of the house, landed on the roof of the car, hit him and killed him instantly, in front of their eyes. I did this presentation, I, I do this multiple times per year, obviously, but I did this presentation in New England recently, and there was a guy that was, was watching the news and watched the interview with the, two, with the parents after that had happened. He goes, he goes, I almost threw up. He goes, it was so disheartening to watch these two people because he goes, I'm in the industry. It was terrible. And I've spoken to technicians that had to go and triage this after it happened. A couple of them had to go to counseling. They had PTSD. They, they just, they, they couldn't handle it. It was too much. So what happened was this. So they were suing that technician. So thank God the tech used an analyzer. His numbers were fine. But one of the things that technician did when he was there was his gas pressure. I know I told you it's important. Things I'm telling you can be verified, proven. You know, you can look up all the information online, Google it, whatever. But use his analyzer. His gas pressure was 3.5. Check that's fine. Okay. So he went up going to court. He was in court for 20 minutes. First five minutes was questioning his numbers because they had another expert there. The last 15 minutes was, why do you think this happened or how did this happen? He goes, it's pretty simple to me. I think it was an issue of gas pressure. So what they did is they started researching it. And they found out that the gas company in question, which I cannot name, but the name begins with a C and ends with an A. Um, if you say it, I will nod. But please don't say it because this is being filmed, but you can ask me after class. I used to say the name. By the way, I was speaking at a convention. And I didn't say the name, but somebody else did really loudly. And that same company was right down the hall. I'm like, would you not say the name? Don't say the name. So anyway, long story short. They found out that instead of the gas pressure being delivered to these properties that day in inches of water column, it was delivered at the rate of over 200 PSI. Regulators were removed, sensors were taken off, the system was pirated by previous employees, they think. That same company in question, which if you Google this, I'll tell you right on the headline, could no longer practice in the state of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, where my office is located in Pennsylvania, in the state of Ohio. So, issue. 39 homes were destroyed. And by the way, the witness accounts when people went to go light their stove top because they had a gas system, they said the flames shot, shot directly up to the ceiling, went down and came down the walls like they were at like a, like a, um, like a carnival show. Crazy. And the, and the main crux of the houses that went up in flames, though, were the houses that were calling for their domestic hot water off their boilers that day because it was not a demand day for heat. 75 degrees that day. They said if this was a demand day for heat, they said, and they've confirmed this three times, over 12,000 houses would have gone up in flames. The 12,000 houses on the grid and the adjacent houses that were in the surrounding area that would have caught from the, from the passing off of the fire or the catching on of the fire. So, you know, we could talk all day, do we think this is important, do we, do we think it's not important? And I could stand up in front of you and you guys all know that I dig this. I don't exactly hate it, as I told you. You can't deny. You can't. 
that all the things I've showed you up to this point, including this, that an analyzer isn't important. Now, would an analyzer prevent this? No, but the analyzer did, they did tell the guy after this was part of the case was settled, the one guy that had his numbers, they said, listen, if you didn't have your gas pressure, now we could have deduced that your, if your gas pressure was fine, probably your oxygen was okay and all these other things that your numbers, but he goes, but they told him, they said, listen, the fact that you had your gas pressure really prevented you from getting lumped into this because you would have been jammed up. So the first part of the case settled for 59 million. Another part of the case, I think, settled for over like 109, 110 million dollars, okay? So if you don't think that gas pressure is important, I beg to differ. Um, it is very, very important, very important. So something to keep in mind. Then you don't want this to be the last thing that you see, all right? Heat exchanger, as we get towards the end here. If you're not aware, AHRI guideline X came out in 2023. It is the guideline for basically verifying if a heat exchanger is cracked in a forced air system. If you don't know what it is, we're going to talk about it. We've got four, uh, me, five different parameters here. Watch for flame disturbances, measure seal in the airstream, measure seal in the stack, verify proper insulation, inspect the heat exchanger. So the only way you can do it is with an analyzer. That just says it in the statute. So when they talk about it in the airstream, it's as simple as putting your probe in the supply register. That's what it is. Okay, and I'm going to get to the crack heat exchanger part in a second, but this part of the protocol, it's as easy as that. Looking at your analyzer, please look at CO air free when you're testing for this, um, and also measuring it in the return, coming into the return air, or in the return group. Okay, then you want to measure it in the stack and obviously look at proper insulation. And I'm going to cover the actual testing, but if you're not aware of this, this is a big deal now, and we're probably going to start to be held account for this, I think, going forward. So just keep that in mind. Is that these, as these guidelines come out, they take them very, very seriously. Again, as I mentioned earlier, what kills heat exchangers? Most time technicians and homeowners. Excessive temperature rise, low temperature rise, excessive fuel input, low fuel input, improper venting, mechanical damage, chemicals in the combustion air zone, and poor filter maintenance, okay? Let's look, we see things like this, rusting, staining, cracks, failures at wells, holes, pitting. So test in the airstream, Test from the supply side, test from the return, nothing more than zero to nine. Now I keep this in here because we have to keep it real specific, but I want obviously zero here is optimal. Focus and be cognizant of your levels. Look for flame disturbances. So here's how we do this. I can explain this five times over if you need me to, but I'm going to try to get it in one shot. Okay. Any force air system. If the system is running when you get there, let it stay at its steady state or run cycle conditions for another three to four minutes, shut it off, let it mellow out. And just hear me out when I, I'll go wrap everything together in a nice little bow. If the system is not running when you get there, turn it on, let it run, let it get to steady state for five to six minutes, shut it off, let it mellow out. What are we doing? Yes. And I'm also very heating it up, but I'm also verifying that the thing works. Make sure it works first. And you're also making sure that it actually has a heartbeat, even though you're not testing gas pressure yet. Make sure it has a heartbeat, because if it had a heartbeat, it wouldn't even turn on, which means if it didn't have any gas pressure, it wouldn't turn on. Because sometimes you go to these places, you have a no heat call, I had no heat. Come to find out, gas meter's locked up. Help if you paid your gas bill, you know, <laughs> would help. But it saved me some time instead of me ripping everything apart, because we don't go after the simple things. We go after the stuff because we want to strap our brains, our technical ability to it. It's like, yeah, no, you want to, no, take care of that. Anyway. And here's what we do. Assuming, and I don't want to say naughty words, but I'm making an S out of you and me. Assuming you've auto zeroed this outside in fresh air, like I've told you, because you like me now, and you've listened to me, okay? You're going to go right to where the furnace is located. Before you even mount this and put the probe in the stack, you're still going to look one more time at that analyzer screen to make sure that right where that furnace is located, nothing has been emitted that is dropping the percentage of oxygen and that you have no CO present because you'd be surprised what you find when things kind of kick off and they out, what you're going to find there. So make sure you have 20.9% oxygen, zero CO, zero CO2, or, zero, uh, or 0 0.06 CO2, depending on the analyzer and the configuration. Once you know that that's the case, analyzer is mounted, probe is put in the stack. System is turned on. Now you're going to focus, okay? Focus. System is turned on. Oxygen is going to plummet. Why? Remember, you're no longer measuring ambient conditions. 
you are now measuring the byproducts of combustion. So oxygen is going to plummet, but CO is going to be on the rise. Don't go, oh my god, don't do that. CO is going to be on the rise. As long as it falls within the levels that we discussed, okay, then you're going to be okay. So, but what's going to happen is in the 15 to 18 to 20 seconds, roughly, the oxygen is going to go doosh, stabilize. It's not going to make that sound, but it's going to stabilize. So say, for purposes of our conversation today, it's stabilized at 6%. Okay. Then, 15 to 18 to 20 seconds later, unless you've jumped it out, the fan's going to come on. When the fan comes on, if that oxygen jumps up 2% or greater, chances are there's a crack there. Why? Let's think of this room, okay? This room is our sealed combustion party. No one is allowed in, okay? I don't care who you know, who your brother knows, what you're wearing, whatever. No one's allowed in. But someone's decided to come in and break in a, a back glass panel, and other people are coming into the party. So what is that like? When the fan comes on, it creates negative pressure. So what it's doing is it's taking and it's trying to pull the interior walls together. Okay, it's trying to, with as much force as it can, try to drive everything together, but there's only so much oxygen encapsulated in that space, in that heat exchanger, which is a 6%, okay? So it can only pull so much it goes, oop, it's kind of like flexing, it does this, and that's all that it can do. However, if there was a crack, guess what it's doing? It's sipping it in with a straw now, because the negative pressure is pulling in, it's pulling in that additional air saying, oh, you can come in, we're so sorry, come in. Like a, like a straw sucking air in. And what's happening is that as that air is coming in, it's driving that oxygen up. So again, when the fan comes on, negative pressure is created. When it's created, it's pulling on those interior walls with so much pressure, but if, it, if there's a crack there, the air is coming in through the crack in the heat exchanger, driving up the oxygen, tick, up two ticks or better. We used to say 1% or greater, no more. 2%, why? There's too much variance amongst electronic tools like this that we had to create somewhat of a more solidified standard that, we've, that we promote, at least that I promote my trainings and others that do this as well, promote a 2% uptick in oxygen. Now, I don't want you to go to the customer and go, see, I told you, 2% oxygen, crack heat exchanger. Don't do that. Show them on the reporting, but also still try to get a picture of it. Do not ever ever let machines like this strictly take over your, your technical ability. Still try to find the crack, still try to get a picture of it. Because what do we do right now? We do visual inspection for crack heat exchanges, right? What you might see, he might not see. Rob, what you might see, I might not see. We go all around the room. We have all different levels of experience in this room, correct? What does that mean? It means variability. What is variability to a contractor? Liability. Liability is like hemorrhoids. Nobody wants it. And that's, by the way, it's a hemorrhoid reference in a combustion presentation. That was pretty good. I did one that with, with, I said trapeze artist last week at AHRI. So anyway, so but liability is a headache that nobody wants. So with an analyzer, it's now a controlled experiment. You can repeat it. So whether you're an expert or whether you're a novice, you can repeat this process over and over again. Okay? So it's something to keep in mind. Everybody clear on that? Because sometimes everybody, well, People learn differently. If you need me to explain it, I will do it offline. I will do it 20 times if you need me to, all right? Anyway, that's just a summary of the test. We're gonna wrap up here in a second. So let's get to. Sure, so we have. So I do, if it's, if it's gonna shoot up like that. So the 200 PPM or greater is potential red tag. The 400 is an advice to lock it. Now I know at light off we can have, for example, on a condensing system up to 1,000, but you, under, under the general crack heat exchanger guidelines and the way that we test, 200, 200 ppm or greater is potential red tank, 400 ppm is an advice to lock out. Okay, so, but I know, you know, for example, atmospheric, 400 ppm, condensing 1,000, but the general guidelines of our overall practice is that. And again, there's different interpretations of this. You need to find out what your magnetic north is. And by the way, before I jump to product stuff, make sure within your companies you have a red tag protocol. Because here's how this works. You're going to get a younger technician that is going to red tag a system, and an older, crabby gentleman like myself is going to go, you don't know what you're doing. You've only been doing this for six months. You want to have a buddy system. 
where someone else comes in and assists in that diagnostic so that everybody is comfortable. So whatever the protocol is and how you're going to shut a system down and what you're going to tell a customer needs to be consistent throughout your companies because you don't want liability, but you also don't want to create turmoil within your customer base as well. So you have to walk that fine line and balance those two concerns. It's very important. So just with a little bit with analyzers, make sure you check your filter on your water trap. Make sure it's clean. Protect your hoses. Don't step on them. You know, with a sharp something sharp in your boot. Smoke test first if you're working on an oil system. Send in an air year for calibration. We don't want to be in your pockets. But listen, this is coming down to you have to eat your own dog food. What does that mean? You got to take your own advice. You want your customer to call you spring and fall for maintenance, correct? Send your nice little toy in once a year to have it calibrated and have a little bit of love shown to it. Take your own advice, send your analyzer in. That's why. Because not only do we calibrate it, but we rip it apart and service it for you. Cold weather care, any 40 degrees or less, bring it in at night. Don't let it be exposed to the elements because cold weather and sensors do not make very good bedfellows. I don't care what analyzer you're talking about. And make sure you empty your water trap. Very important because you want that to freeze. A little bit on us. Uh, that is myself with the Godfather of Combustion, Jim Davis. Uh, we are now with, partnered with the National Comfort Institute. NCI has been using our analyzers for a year and a half. So they can give you their feedback on it. I'm not going to speak for them, but I think that they dig them. Um, so it seems like it's gone very well, and I'm happy that it has, and it is an honor and a pleasure to be affiliated with them, and we strive to do everything possible to make sure they can do their jobs as easy as possible. And we are also now on MeasureQuick. So we're now part of the MeasureQuick family. We've been just under a year now we've been with MeasureQuick and it's gone very, very well. So we are the analyzer on MeasureQuick. And the partnership that I struck up with NCI and with MeasureQuick, they, that now is um, Sprouted Baby. So now NCI and MeasureQuick are doing things together as well by their own conversations, which is even better for our industry. So pretty cool. Um, just a little bit on the analyzers. I have the 030 model here, by the way. Both of these here are on the MeasureQuick platform. This one here it will eventually be on there. Both of these are on, and these two here are both used by NCI in their trainings. So this is a residential light commercial model right here. This is a residential commercial model. This is the flagship. This is more entry level, but it is anything but entry level. It is really not. It's just we had to call it something. So this is our, our base model here. You can add NOx to this one. You can add NOx or low NOx to this one because we're eventually going to have to start accounting for that as things go green as well because the carbon footprint is being highly scrutinized now and they're going to know what we're putting into the environment if we're not using it a full electric system. So just keep that in mind. And you don't need to get a new analyzer to upgrade your analyzer with us. You just got to upgrade the sensors, which does change the model number and now makes it the next model or the next tier up. So what do we have for features? So we have the following. This is where we differentiate. Five-year oxygen sensor, longest out there. Four to five year CO sensor, longest out there. Four to five year NOx sensor, longest out there. Sensor life indicator, it's the only one that has it. So you can actually see how much sensor life you have left. Nothing worse than using your analyzer and having a dead sensor. I've been there. Second of all, we think you're going to forget to look at the sensor life indicator. We have an end of life indicator, which is an algorithm built in the analyzer that reads the current being sent from the sensor back to the motherboard. Knows when that current starting to slow down and when the analyzer, when the, when the sensor is hitting an age point. End of life indicator in there. CO sensor in there, 8,000 ppm with programmable pump cutoff, so you can, you're never going to swake your CO sensor again because it will automatically put the, cut the pump off. You can customize when you want the pump to shut off. It's customizable within all the analyzers. So all the features I'm giving you are with all the analyzers here. Again, we're on measure quick. No more grocery store style receipts. You're used to a little grocery store receipt here. No longer. Three to ten page report with the following. Your company logo up to eight photos that you can incorporate from our app, which we have an app that goes to the analyzer, or from your camera roll, up to 60 readings, technician notes section, signature section for both you and the customer. Also, if you use MeasureQuick, MeasureQuick is affiliated with Service Titan, so you have that drop in there through the MeasureQuick platform. Up to five different parameter alarms you could set up on the analyzer. So if you're setting up a furnace or boiler, you could have min or maxes in there, and as you hit those, uh, hit those parameters, visual alert will go off on your analyzer letting you know you fit that parameter. So we have a feature set here that no one else has, and service time. None of this works without service time. Five days in season, which is now, one to two days spring and summer. Doesn't get much quicker than that. If it does, we'll try to do it. Um, real quick, what some of the visuals look like. Different probes, uh, you can get printer, you can get, um, this is what the reporting looks like. This is done for Cleaver Brooks. Job photos you, hear, you have here. We have, uh, that's just a sample of the four. 
And we have a video, uh, Craig Macy Service Tech. It was nice enough to film the combustion video, so if you want to see it, it's on his site. So that is yours truly on there. We've, it's done pretty well for us, and it seems to help people around. And so if it helps you, I'm happy that it helps you if you want to watch it. And um, our, also our, our YouTube channel there for ourselves. That's it. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, HVACRschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast available on all your favorite podcast apps. And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community. Vortex by Tex.